All right, welcome, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Jessica Wright and I'll be moderating today's event. Um, just a few housekeeping notes. Everybody has been placed on mute, so we ask that you remain on mute um, for the duration of the presentation. We do want this to be interactive and engaging, so please feel free to send questions in the chat. Um, we've already put a question in there just asking where everybody is, what their major is, and what school they go to. Um, that's really interesting information for our presenters. So um, you can adjust the view so you can see more than a couple lines and you're welcome to share video and not be shy. We love to see your faces. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so in today's presentation, you will hear an overview of Corning Life Sciences Division from Eva Noakes who works in scientific support. Corning has been a trusted supplier to the healthcare and pharmaceutical industries since we introduced Pyrex Glass in 1915. Today, we are a leader in life sciences laboratory tools and products, cell culture solutions, bioprocess vessels, and specialty services. So with that, Eva, I'm turning it over to you. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for coming and inviting me here. Let's see if I can, okay, let's see. Can everyone see my screen here? Bye. Okay, just going to put this up so that I can see the chat too. Okay. All right, so I want to first start out with just um, a quick little thing. I want to see if my video will work here. This is my first test of whether the video will work. Let me try this. You can tell me in the chat if it doesn't work. Please. What I like about working in Corning Life Sciences is there is a lot of different projects, a lot of different products, um, a lot of room to expand your knowledge. To develop yourself and to grow professionally with different trainings. We actually uh, make products that make uh, a change in people's lives. At Corning Life Sciences, we have been developing products that play a critical role in scientific discovery for over 100 years. And we are as passionate about solving our customers' challenges as they are about solving global health issues. Thousands of labs around the world are using one or more of our brands, and our products play a key role in the development of better treatment for patients or, or better development of drugs. We helped enable the production and distribution of world-changing drugs like penicillin and the polio vaccine. We support advances in cellular research that provide new understanding of human disease. We even developed products to be used in space. I am proud to be part of, uh, of innovation. Every single person that works, works here or for Corning should, uh, should be proud of that. Today, we're supporting our customers as they tackle cell therapy and advanced techniques such as 3D cell culture. These advances are opening the door for breakthroughs that will change people's lives in areas such as cancer research, neurological disorder treatments, and in vitro fertilization. As a customer service representative as well, I will be connected for the customer at least to the success of their research or their project. So that's, uh, that's very nice to be able to allow that. For over 100 years, we have been enabling people around the world to make life-changing and life-saving discoveries. And we are always looking for talented, passionate individuals to join our team. What discoveries will you help accelerate? Okay, so I just learned if I wanna to try to move anything off of my screen, it stops the video. So I will know that for next time. <laughs> Let's see. All right, so what I want to talk about today is just um, a, a really short slide on how I got here, how I got to Corning, and then what I do at Corning Life Sciences, and then go into what kinds of products does CLS sell, and then a timeline of how we got to where we are, and then because of where we are in life, I um, wanted to include a little bit about how we're doing with COVID-19 and testing, 
And then wanted to end with showing you guys my uh, my favorite customer inquiry of all time. Of the five years I've been here. And yes, please let me know questions. I can't see the chat thing because somebody said it was in the way. So I can, um, Jessica, maybe if you can tell me if there's things there. So yep, I can buy a I'm a total New England girl. I, my whole life has been right around here in, uh, within, I guess, 76 miles of itself, as Google tells me. So I started out in a little town called Wilmington and stayed there until I was junior high and then moved into another town for middle and high school. And then I went all the way to Boston for my bachelor's degree at Simmons and got a bachelor's in neuropsychology and then went on to Brandeis University where I got a, where I was a lab technician for a few years and then went on to get my PhD in cell and molecular biology. And this is my daughter. She did not graduate that day, but she just wanted to wear the robe. So. And then I moved on to a drug discovery company. This was a small startup in Cambridge, Mass. I was employee number 10 when we started. So I got to learn a whole lot about everything because there weren't very many people. So some days there were 20 and then 30 and then 40 and then it would go back down to 10. So um, I got to learn a lot. And, but I also, if you know anything about drug discovery, biotech, it's um, a lot of work. Weekends don't exist and things like that. So I was ready to move out of the lab and that's when I found Corning up in Tuxbury. So then I actually moved up here and I moved, lived like a mile and a half from the house I first grew up in. So that's kind of fun. So I lived there with my, uh, with my boyfriend who would kill me if I put his picture up and my fur babies. I also do have a human baby who, this is her getting her master's degree at Brandeis of all places. And she pretty much grew up there when I was in the lab all the time. And then my happy places are my house in Vermont, which is just a nice place in the middle of nowhere to disappear. And then anything here on the coast, any kind of beach, any kind of lobster. So that's that's me in a basic nutshell. So what do I do at Corning? So I am the manager of the uh, scientific support team in North America. So we have we have teams in North America, in Europe, Middle East, and Africa, in China, Greater Asia, and in Japan. So in each of those regions, we have a me and a group that answers questions in house. So we answer. We all come from the lab, so we answer customer questions on what product they should use, how they should use it. We look at application notes, te technical documents, protocols, basically anything they want to know, we're supposed to know the answers to, so we can help them with that. We also sometimes go out for seminars or trainings. Then we also have applications labs. We have one in Kennebunk, Maine, and one in Shanghai. And these guys, they conduct in-lab experiments with our products. So to work out protocols, look at, can this happen? So customers might say, can I grow that cell on this thing? And, and then the lab can do it, or maybe they already have done it. So, and they do publish scientific papers and protocols. And then we also have field application specialists. So these guys are available for on-site technical support. So we have a big bioprocess line, and this really requires a person to go into the lab for a week or weeks to optimize and set things up for a customer before they can um, can use the product. Let's see. So what kinds of products do we sell? So we have around 20,000 catalog numbers. I think that number changes a lot, but we have labware consumables, equipment, and um, huh, biologists. I think that I meant to say biologics there. So see. And that we do have products in pretty much every lab. When I do technical trainings or anything to salespeople, I can say we have so many things that you can just go into any lab. We can go into hospitals, universities, high schools, small companies, big companies, government labs. We really have a whole breadth of products to be able to get into a lot of different labs. So, so the salespeople like that. So in terms of what types of products does CLS sell? So we have the... Uh, the microbiology products. So these are these are basically products for growing bacteria, something, some things for food testing, water testing, anything in the microbiology realm. I'll show you more of those in a minute. And then we have molecular biology products. This is anything amplifying, testing, DNA, RNA. And then we have equipment, really small benchtop equipment mostly for 
all different types of research and labs. So does anyone know what, what product CLS is best known for? Like our bread and butter kind of products. I can see the chat box now, so. Any guesses? No? Okay. Close, yes. So those are glassware, cell stack, hyper stack, flask. Yes, those all would follow under cell culture. So we're we're very well known for, for cell culture materials. And those things, cell stack, hyper stack, flask, glassware, those all fit into the realm of cell culture. So then what is cell culture is the question. So cell culture is the process of taking cells out of living tissues and keeping them alive outside the organism. Simple explanation, but it's been around in some form since the late 1800s and cells can be grown stuck, like you see here, stuck on a surface or in suspension floating around. Let's see. So for cell culture, basically you need a vessel. So some sort of dish, flask, plate, with the roller bottles, the hyperflax, hyperstacks, people mentioned cell stacks, spinners. And then oftentimes there's some kind of coating or treatment to the plastic because different cell types will need different things. And then of course cells. And then the cells need food, nutrients, media, serum, all that stuff to eat and grow. So we have products for all of these different steps of cell culture. So we really have a beginning to end cell culture workflow. And then also tools for downstream applications like DNA analysis. This is a C. I just really like that little video showing the cell culture. So, um, so about the the timeline. So, how did we get here? So, as we said in the intro and another time, that Pyrex has been in labware since 1915. So, Pyrex vessels used to manufacture penicillin, polio vaccine. This is some Pyrex glass, a perfusion pump. So, it's been around for a long, a long time. So I was wondering if anyone has read this book. If you haven't, you really should. Do people know Henrietta's story? I'm gonna take that as a no. Yes, okay, good. Amanda does, Jessica does not. So I'll, I'll try to have um, Hank Green, or John Green explain it for just one minute. And then I'm going to show you something cool. Henrietta Lacks was born exactly 96 years ago today on August 1st, 1920 in Southern Virginia. She died of cancer at the age of 31. She was a poor tobacco farmer and mother of five, but she was also indirectly responsible for one of the biggest medical breakthroughs of all time. Because a part of her lives on today in the form of cells that are used for research all around the world. And scientists recently figured out a part of what makes her cells so special. In 1951, Lax went to Johns Hopkins Hospital, the only hospital in her area that treated African American patients back then, to be treated for an aggressive form of cervical cancer. While he was examining her, the doctor took a tissue sample from her tumor to use for his research. He didn't ask for permission or tell her how her genetic sample might be used, which isn't really surprising since informed consent wasn't a standard practice at the time. Then he he gave her cells to a Johns Hopkins tissue specialist who looked at her cells under a microscope and found something he'd been searching for for years. See, most cells typically divide 40 or so times before dying, but lax cells just kept on going. 
controlled environment in the lab, some of her cells kept dividing with no signs of slowing down. It was the first so-called immortal cell line, a population of cells with a mutation that allows them to grow and be kept alive for a really long time. 65 years later, the cells are still going. Other immortal cell lines have since been developed. Some of them, like the cells that came from lax, have mutations that showed up naturally. Others were engineered on purpose. But ever since the original HeLa cells, named after the first two letters of lax's first and last name, were put into mass production, they've allowed generations of scientists to perform experiments experiments and critical research in cell biology without having to use an actual living person. And that was, and continues to be, a very big deal. Even though they're cancerous and genetically different from typical human cells, HeLa cells still behave like normal cells in a lot of important ways, so they're incredibly useful for studying things like bacteria, hormones, and especially viruses. Since the early 1950s, researchers have been subjecting HeLa cells to all sorts of viruses, both to study how the cells reacted and to develop life-saving vaccines. Take polio, for example. Before HeLa, researchers mostly studied it by infecting rhesus monkey cells with the virus to measure and harvest antibodies, but it was impossible to get enough of those monkey cells to properly test potential vaccines in a reasonable amount of time. So Jonas Salk used HeLa cultures instead and was eventually able to create, test, and mass-produce his famous polio vaccine. Since then, billions and billions of HeLa cells have been created, enough cells to to wrap around the Earth at least three times. They've helped researchers create other vaccines and been used to develop treatments for diseases like herpes, Parkinson's, and some kinds of cancer. They've also been used to study things like cloning, genetics, and the effects of radiation. There are tens of thousands of papers that are based on HeLa cells in some way, but for decades, We won't let John keep talking. Yeah, researchers couldn't, couldn't figure, figure out exactly Okay, so if you haven't um, if you haven't read that book, you absolutely should. The movie is is not as doesn't uh, really do the do justice to the book, but the the movie is really interesting because when they were filming it, we got a call into the scientific support group from a producer on the on the movie, and he wanted to talk to someone at Corning and Pyrex so that they could make sure that the glassware they were using in the labs and everything else was really historically accurate. So one of our agents picked it up and called corporate and got the right people involved so that we could get the the right glass to the movie. So that was just a really neat thing. That um, This is just a short little clip of Oprah, who was in the movie, seeing the cells for the first time. Go ahead. Is that really her? That's her. There are millions of Henrietta cells in there. Wow. Like in the movie, when she has it, she goes, "She's cold." That's right. This is warm. This is so. These are the real cells. Just grew them. We. Wow. We did not even have the real cells in the movie, Dr. Oz. This is fantastic. <laughs> that is fantastic. The guys at New York Medical College drew these for us. Come on uh, over here. I actually put some under the microscope. I want you to see them with your own eyes. Rose, go ahead and take a look. Yes. Don't poke your eyes out. Look Rose, this please. is just like in the movie. Oh goodness, yes. She looks like a journalist scientist now, doesn't she? Wow. wow. And we're gonna and we're gonna put them up in the big monitor. This is just uh, like in the movie. I know, isn't it great? So you guys go ahead and look, and when Rose is done, open, take a look. So the reason this cracks me up so much is because, you know, I worked in labs for most of my life. So these things are just second nature to me. And it's really fun that, um, that we can, you know, people get so fascinated by things that I find just like are just everyday things. I don't know if you caught on to that, but when she was looking through the microscope, there was some um, orange cap flasks over there. So yeah, that is a corning flask that they were using on Dr. Oz. So. People in my house or people around me always get frustrated with me because we'll be watching pretty much any show and I'll say, oh, look, that's ours, that's ours, that's ours. And uh, drive people a little crazy sometimes. Let's see. Hey, everybody else, this is what Oprah's Oprah. seen. Okay, so got to get used to this. Move me. Okay. So the question is, how did we get from, you know, doing the Pyrex to all of a sudden having 20,000 catalog numbers? So I'm taking guesses on a word that fits in here that helped us to get from, from glassware to 
all of this. Anyone? Starts with an A. Aha, you got it. And see, so this is a really weird word. I had to look it up and make sure I spelled it right because it didn't look right to me. But yes, through acquisitions is how we got from glassware all the way into here to all these very diverse different products. So the first one was the CoStar acquisition in 1993, the year I graduated high school. So this is when um, Corning acquired CoStar. So CoStar had all kinds of different plastic wear and consumables for cell culture. So cell culture had moved away from glass dishes and into more plastic disposable flasks, plates, all the different sizes. So with the CoStar acquisition, we got access to all this other tissue culture and cell culture um, consumables. So that just upped the, up the, what we could do for cell culture. And then in 2009, the oxygen acquisition. So this brought along with it all kinds of molecular biology products and a lot of equipment. So a lot of small kind of equipment, centrifuges and water baths and things that you, know, you need for cell culture. And also a whole new line of molecular biology products that we didn't previously have. So any kind of molecular analysis that he's doing, now we had those tools for that. Also along with oxygen came lots of different kinds of tubes, screw top tubes and snap cap tubes and all kinds of other things. So that was a big, a big product lines came in there. And then in 2010, the Gosselin acquisition came along and this is a company based in France and these have, this is where all the food testing, water testing, uh, microbiology equipment, everything else comes in. So, and then in this line too, we have all different kinds and sizes of containers and it might seem silly, but everybody needs containers of some sort or another. They need different kinds of plastics. They need different kinds of caps. They need different temperature requirements. So this brought in a whole new, whole new section there. So microbiology, but also some of the containers can be used for lots of other things. And then in 2011, MediaTek came along. So this was the cell grow line. So this brought along all kinds of media, serum, cell culture reagents. So these are things that you put into the cell culture to help the cells, you know, to keep them alive and fed and everything they need. So that was another big piece of the puzzle that had been missing. And then the big one in 2012 was part of BD Discovery Labware. So this, anyone who was in labs before, even now, so Corning always had the orange caps and Falcon had the blue caps. And every lab, every person in every lab had a, had a thing that they wanted. They wanted the blue tubes or they wanted the orange tubes and they, they weren't switching. So then, and they were major competitors. So now with the acquisition of Discovery Labware BD, we can now sell the, the orange caps and the blue caps to pretty much satisfy all those, the different customers. So that was a big line in there. And, and also people in labs, they'll, they'll call these kind of tubes, they'll call them Falcon tubes, even when they're not Falcon. So it's real brand recognition to have those. Even if somebody has a Corning tube, they might say, hey, can I have a you know 15 mil Falcon? And somebody hands them a Corning tube. It's just one of those Band-Aid effect kind of things. And then also with Discovery Lab where it came along uh, Major Gel, which you may have heard of, and a lot of other coatings and coated plates. So this is the different cell types might need a different cell surface or a coating or something to so that the cells can grow better. They can attach and they can grow better. And each cell type is going to have their own their own preferences and what they need. And so with with Discovery Lab, where it came along, all these biologics products. So that just further expanded everything in the cell culture realm. And then, so with the Falcon, there was this really funny video. It's really short, don't worry. And it's my last one.
So we need to find ways to keep the Falcon brand top of mind for scientists in the lab. Since we have such high standards of quality, <laughs> I was thinking we could do a factory tour video, show our quality control tests, things like that. What do you guys think? Yeah. That's good. What if we go heartfelt? We show scientists working long hours in the lab. Then we show their motivation. All the sick kids who will benefit from their research breakthroughs. Throw in some dramatic music. No, 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 I got it. This is what we do. We put a live falcon in every box. Get it? Every lab needs falcon. We give every lab a falcon. <laughs> Where are all the mice? Where are all the mice? Or we could just go with Hannah's tour idea. That's fine, too. I like your tour idea. Yeah, thank you. I think it's really good. Okay, so now with all those acquisitions, then we... We had the whole whole gamut for the cell culture. So for vessels, now they had CoStar and Falcon. And then for coatings and pre-covered, pre-coated plates, that was Discovery Labwares. And then we do have some some number of cells, not a whole lot, from Discovery Labware. And then all the media, serum, growth factors, and everything else from MediaTek. So now there's that whole complete picture of growing the cells start to finish. And then also the tools for downstream applications with oxygen coming along, any kind of molecular analysis of those cells was, was there and ready to go. Let's see. Okay. So now I'll go on to kind of CLS and COVID-19 and what's been going on with that. So we have, we're in a unique situation at CLS because a lot of our customers went home you know, academic labs and everything else had to go home. And so sales were lost there where they went home and they couldn't, they couldn't buy those things. But then there was this whole other section of scientists who need to test for COVID, who needs to do other things. So we actually had to get more of some of the products available for COVID-19 test kits. Our phones were ringing off the hook for, for tubes and bottles and anything like that. So anything needed to collect, transport, store samples. That's been a big thing because everybody needs those for the, and everybody needs test kits. And then we also had to rapidly launch a couple of, of really needed products. So one was the viral transport media. So the CDC had put out a recipe for, for a, um, a media to hold the virus while you're transferring it to wherever it gets, um, gets tested. And it gave, you know, all the different ingredients and exactly how you should make it. And we sold most of the ingredients or all of them, I think. And so those were flying off the shelves while people were trying to make these medias. And then we realized that, you know, if we could put this all together for people, that would, that would be fill a real need. So we've been quickly, quickly launched some uh, viral transport media. Also some automation tips. So I didn't go into any of that, but this is basically liquid handling. So any kind of moving large amounts of liquid around and these, everybody doing testing and things like that, they, they need a lot of these tips. And so we had to launch some new tips. So each kind of tip fits with one kind of machine. So we actually had to quick launch some that fit some other machines that we didn't previously have capability for. So that's been, a lot of people have been working really, really hard the last few months on um and trying to get all this out to this, and they're all so needed. And then also, there's also products that are needed for just basic COVID research, people trying to figure out how this thing works. We still don't know a whole lot. And then also vaccine research and development, and people looking for a cure, all the drug discovery. So there's a lot of people doing work in these. So all of these products are really, really helpful to them. And then also tools for COVID testing. So the actual tests that people put out. We have products that are used for those too. So there's two main types of testing 
there's the diagnostic test for a current infection. And this is usually kind of a molecular biology based. Is the sequence there? Is it not there? And then there's also a serological test to look for if you have the antibodies. And so for, let's see, for all of those kinds of tests, we have different things like tubes and liquid handling and equipment and these products that keep things cold on the bench and just general labware that people need. And then for the molecular tests, they also need any kind of PCR products. So we have plates and tubes and strips and we have a thermal cycler. So this is for amplifying DNA, anything like that. And then some kits that will help purify that DNA and other things that they may need. And then for the serological, let's see, for the serological tests, we have these plates that will bind a protein or bind so that the um, so that they can detect the antibodies in in samples. Okay, you guys have asked zero questions, so um, I'm already here at the end in only half an hour. <laughs> Uh, so hopefully you have questions at the end because I have lots of time left. So I wanted to just tell you about my favorite inquiry ever. Let's see. This, let's see, I'll move you out of the way. This customer called a few years back and he sent this email and he said, Dear sir or madam, I've been doing cell culture work for 30 plus years and have never had difficulty with your products in the past. Recently, I've had the most bizarre results with your plates. My support workers are convinced the cell cultures have been fixed by aliens, visited my plates to form cell crop circles. The cells do not attach evenly, but rather form concentric circles on the surface of the dishes. This has occurred with multiple cell types. I'm attaching some photos to show what I mean. As a scientist, I do not believe this evidence supports alien visitation, but rather that the machine used to cast these plates was somehow dirty or contaminated with oil. Have you had other complaints or comments about these plates? Can you offer a replacement for this batch? Thank you for your help. So this is actually something that we've seen here and there. It's not an uncommon problem. So I don't know if anyone can guess what the problem might be. I wouldn't have been able to guess, but maybe the engineers out there could guess. Or maybe people have seen this before, I'm not sure. No guesses. So this is this is a weird phenomenon that happens when there's any kind of vibration in the lab. So when I was talking to this guy, I got him on the phone and I'm talking to him and I asked him, I said, any chance anybody's doing some construction nearby? And he said, no, I don't think so. And then he went and asked around and sure enough, the building next door was doing construction overnight. So when these cells were sitting in their incubator and just happily trying to grow, they were vibrating so it forms these little circles and so we actually had a good laugh about it and um and showed him this is a really common problem and then he moved the incubator to the other side of the room and it stopped happening so this is just it's kind of the fun part of my job that i can you know sometimes just have these like moments and people are like oh my god you saved me thank you so much so um so that's always nice to hear but this was my i did like this one Okay, so did you replace the plates for them? I don't think we did in this case. So we often do. They're, um, so when, when people do complain about or call, you know, put in a complaint about something like a vessel, like a flask or a plate or something like that, we do troubleshoot with them to try to figure out what the problem is first because if we just go sell, send them another set of plates right away and they're still doing things wrong, that's not going to help them. So we do try to figure out what the what the problem is first. And then, you know, if it's a probable quality issue, we will, you know, start an investigation with the manufacturing plant. And we want to make sure everything is really fine. And even in the cases where it is, you know, something else, we often will replace them anyway. I can't remember really if we did in this case. So a lot of times we do just to keep a customer happy and because they lost time and you know, it's not, it's not their fault. They didn't know. So even though there's nothing wrong with the plates, we probably would have if, um, if they'd asked, I just, I don't remember on this one. In general, we always replace anytime anybody puts in a issue up to a certain dollar amount, of course. 
<laughs> there are limits. Um, okay, so I got a couple questions in my chat. Okay. Um, so the first one is, how long can cultures stay alive outside the body? That totally depends on the cell type. Um, months, sometimes. I worked with um, some patient cystic fibrosis cells from Children's Hospital at my drug discovery company, and we kept them for months on end, on a corning product, I might say. But uh, <laughs> we, it, it really depends on the cell type and on how, how much you baby them, how much you take care of them. So those those primary patient cells, we had to feed them every day, every day. And um, I mean, that means Christmas, that means every day <laughs> we went in and fed them. And these are cystic fibrosis cells. So they, they grew on a monolayer on a, on a corning snap well plate so that the air can be on the top and they actually get all kind of mucus buildup. So you have to go in and suck off the mucus and clean them and feed them. And, but if you treat them right, they can, um, they can go for a long time, totally dependent on the cell type. How did you discover this is what you wanted to do? Um, long, long stories. Um, I always thought I wanted to be a doctor growing up. And then my father, the engineer, very blunt man, said to me, um, no, you would be horrible at it. He said, <laughs> he said, you're gonna screw up and somebody's gonna die and you're not gonna be able to handle it. And I was like, but you know what? He was probably right that I can't handle. Like, there's there's no way I could have. And I also realized after that that I have to keep learning. I think um, I needed something where I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly challenged. What I what I love about what I'm doing now is I still get to stay science adjacent. I still get to read science. I still get to talk science with customers. But I get to say, okay, why don't you try that and um, call me on Monday and tell me how it went rather than actually being in the lab 10 hours a day and doing it myself. So I, for me, this is a perfect combination of those things. And I just, I'm a person that loves helping people out. I get so much joy when somebody says like, oh, you really helped me out. And you know, you saved my experiment. You, I wouldn't get my PhD without you. So it's, um, it's really rewarding for me. So keeps my brain active in my everything else. And I, and I love the people at CLS too. Do you get to publish your work in international conferences if you work for CLS? Some, so we do go to, so the people in the lab do publish. They, they publish in peer reviewed journals. They also do go to most of the different conferences. Um, so yes, they present posters at, most of the labs present posters at all of the major conferences and then also do publish in some peer reviewed journals. How do you stay on top of trends in the market? There are, there's, there's a lot of people involved in that question. So there are all kinds of people involved in strategy and constantly looking and, you know, looking at the market and everything else, but there's also our salespeople and us and our field applications people are constantly getting that voice of customer back too. So constantly going out to labs and the, the salespeople and everyone who are in the, and the, especially the sales specialists are pretty technical. They go into these labs and they hear customers say like, oh, I would really love it if this happened or I'm seeing this from your competitor and why can't you do that? So there are, our customers really help us a lot on figuring out what's coming out, what they want, what they've seen from other places. And um, so I think the voice of customer, the salespeople in the field are invaluable. This was asked earlier, what is your favorite part about your job? Um, Yes, my favorite part, I, I think it's the people. I think it's the really helping out customers and knowing that my knowledge means something and that all those painful years in the lab were worth something because I can, you know, sometimes somebody can just say something. I'm like, oh, it might be this thing or it might be that thing or, you know, and really help someone out. And I, I get a lot of joy from helping people and from helping stressed out scientists and grad students and trying to figure out what they, do. Um, do you guys offer jobs in the Corning headquarters at Corning, New York for CLS? Not a whole lot. Uh, most of the jobs are based in Tewksbury. Well, no, sorry. Where I am right now is headquarters in Tewksbury, Mass. We have labs and plants all over the world. 
at in Corning, we have one plant in Oneonta. So that's not too far. It's like half an hour or something. And then, but there's not a whole lot of other headquarters. We do have some people who are based in Corning that, um, yeah, they, it, it's kind of a deal <laughs> where they travel to Tuxbury here and there, but they're, you know, we still, we, we let them work basically remote. I think there's, and there are a couple people that work in headquarters, but as a general rule, I don't think we hire from Corning, but I mean, if you're awesome and we can probably work something out. So, uh, what advice would you give someone who loves life sciences, but does not have a formal background in life sciences? You don't have to have a background, um, for a lot of this. So some things you can pick up. And you don't have to have the in depth technical knowledge to do a lot of. A lot of the work we do. And especially in the lab and. If you, if you really think you love life sciences, you could probably get a technician job or something in a lab and get a little closer. If you're in college, you can volunteer at a lab. Everyone loves free labor. <laughs> And they will help you out. And if you get into the right lab and the right mentor, you can go amazing places. It's all about what mentor you get and who's helping you. And scientists love to help other scientists. So if you're serious and you are committed and love your work, people will take care of you. You will be mentored. And um, so that's a uh, that's. I mean, I wouldn't be where I am without my mentor as my PhD advisor and other there. Um, Okay, I'm based in Corning, yes. So uh, outside of Valor Glass, how closely are you working with pharma companies on the COVID vaccine? I am not privy to the the knowledge of the the intricate um, re company relationships until they get pretty public. So I, I can't really comment on that. I know that our key customers, we are constantly in contact with. So the product managers and the everybody are constantly talking to to, to customers, but so I would say pretty close, but I can't comment on any specific customer, any specific product. Sorry for the non-answer. <laughs> What's the most impactful project you've worked on? Oh goodness, you're throwing out crazy questions. Let's see. Um, most impactful project. I think right now I'm I'm working on kind of a big project on getting all of our customers what they what they need quicker, kind of moving us into working on our website a lot, working on things that previously customers used to have to call us for or used to have to email or anything else. We're trying to get all that stuff to the forefront so that they can just find it. So when they're in the lab at 10 o'clock at night, we're not here on the phone. So if they can you know, pick up their phone and, and find it on the website and find the information themselves. So that's been a big push for us on um, trying to make sure that the customers can self-serve more and that we use our people for you know, the things that customers really need us for, which is more discussions and visits and things like that and not, not some of the other stuff. So. I feel like that is it's been a good project and it's going to continue to be a good project until we get to where we can really um really go get them what they need um okay i think there were two questions there let's see what's the future future products for cls i can't actually speak to that um anything i would know it's not public yet so I can't, I can't really speak to that. And then the next big product, um, where do you see the business is headed? Not sure I can speak to all of this right now. Um, I mean, really the, the strategy teams work really well, really closely with customers to figure out kind of what they, what they need, what they, um, what people are wanting. And it's a, you know, it's a business that's going to keep growing. It's uh, it's nothing. We're just going to find cures and find this and find that, and uh, and then it's all going to go away. So it's a constantly developing field. Everything changes. 
new technologies come out. So um, I also can't, um, I, yeah, I can't comment on what the next big, you know, anything that's not public, I can't comment on. So, but I, we're, it will go, it will go well. So, you know, we've got people constantly working, very smart people and working on, you know, what's next, what can we do next? And how can we better help our customers? Because we really, you know, care the most about helping the customers and getting them what they need. And they're very good at telling us what, what we don't do right. <laughs> so <laughs> we can always get new ideas from them, but yeah, I'm sorry, I can't comment on anything in particular. And then there is another question. In Do you have any tips on what skills you should hire if you're targeting the CLS for a job other than the degree? Sorry, can you repeat that? Do you have any tips on what skills you should acquire if you are targeting CLS for a job other than the degree? Other than the degree. Um, It, if you want a job in in a lab or in the tech tech technical piece, then experience is good. Being able to say, "I've worked in a cell culture lab. I've worked in this lab. I have this." Anytime you can say you've you've done something like that, that helps. So again, if you're at college and you can you can volunteer for free to, you know, I started out racking tips and cleaning mouse cages. So people will take whatever help they can get, and that will also get you the right connections. Everybody should have a really good LinkedIn page with a picture. I have never, every time I get a resume in my box, I immediately go to LinkedIn. And if you don't have a picture, I'm done. Or if it's not a nice, I've also hired 22 year olds right out of college a few times because they had beautiful LinkedIn professional uh, profiles. And they actually all still work here. They're all, they've all moved up. They all do amazing work. And they had, you know, restaurant experience when they started. So it's it's not about what is on there. It's a uh, it's about being professional, looking out for the right people, networking, getting to know anyone, and you can, yeah, just getting to know people, networking, LinkedIn, and uh, volunteer where you can. Any kind of work experience is good. Any kind of but and classes are, I mean, they're classes. Anyone can can take stuff online now. So the degree is important. It's a necessity for a lot of positions, but for for me at least, and for other people, it's it's really about um, what you can do. And for Corning, we really have a a culture of developing people, of taking care of people, of mentoring people. So, and it's something we really take seriously. I it's that might be actually my favorite part of my job is is mentoring people, developing people, and also getting mentored and developed by people who have been here a lot longer than me and are a lot smarter than me. So it's it's a really big push to to get people where they need to go. So if you are driven and you're trying, that that goes amazing amazingly far. Awesome. Um, thank you. I think that we have gotten to all of the questions. So um, to our participants, thank you so much for giving us some of your time to hear this overview. And Eva, thank you so much. I loved this presentation. I loved all the videos and the personal aspects of it. So really, really appreciate your time, um, your energy, and just the overall great representation for life sciences. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone who had more questions? And... Okay, I think I'm unmuted. You're good now. You're good now. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so thank you all. Thank you for the good questions. And um, yeah, I'm happy to talk to anyone. You can uh, find me on LinkedIn. <laughs> awesome, have a great rest of the day, everybody. Okay, thank you, everybody.